Welcome to Garden Gossip, Big Blend Radio's home and garden show. Come on, let's grow together. Hey, everybody, welcome. Uh, you know we love to talk about vegetable gardening and being successful with it and keeping it easy, right? That's important. And one of the easiest things to do when you're gardening is to work with nature. Because nature, if you do that and follow her principles, you're going to have an easier garden to maintain and work with. And then you're also working with nature. So, you know, you're also feeding birds and you're creating a ecosystem, which we love. That's a good thing about gardening, especially with your family, um, maybe even having a backyard habitat. And today I'm excited because we have Christina Chung joining us. Uh, go to her a follower on Instagram at fluent.garden. But her new book is coming out through Cool Springs Press. Uh, that is going to be out February 6th, so you can probably pre-order it right now. It is called The Layered Edible Garden, A Beginner's Guide to Creating a Productive Food Garden Layer by Layer. And it's beautiful. You know how we love beautiful gardening books like we love good cookbooks, you know? Uh, it's one of those. But um, she's really working with nature. So welcome, Christina. How are you? Thank you, Lisa. I'm doing very well. Thank you. Just getting ready for a cold snap. That's going to be hitting the region very soon. So what do you do? Do you, do you cry and go inside? <laughs> like, I want to be outside. I mean, cause you're in the Pacific Northwest and actually we're recording uh, from Oregon right now. So, um, it's kind of, it's, I get why you have to have this weather because summer and spring and fall are beautiful, but I'm just saying, do you kind of get the blues? during this time of year? Yeah, don't out? remind me. So anytime there's sun, um, I'll be outside trying to soak up the rays. I'm basically like a plant. Um, but to answer <laughs> your question, what am I doing right now anticipating the cold snap? I'm trying to protect my perennials. So um, like in the book, I talk a lot about perennial plants that can last for many years. So there's lots of food for you to enjoy over many seasons. Um, because I have these longer lived, I call them investment plants that I've spent more than a few dollars on. Um, I do sure. want to protect them. Um, because right now we are heading into colder than normal, colder than average temperatures for January. Um, I need to protect the roots of the plants. Um, a lot of the times the upper portions of plants, depending on what plant it is, if it's well adapted, um, it may bounce back come spring, but mm. with the roots that are in the soil, and especially if there are plants in containers, they don't bounce back as well, um, especially here in the Pacific Northwest, where it's usually a combination of wet and cold. And I always tell people that combination can be disastrous. <laughs> so I'm just trying to yeah, protect the roots because I know there's moisture in the soil and whether it's mulch or sheets of cardboard, I'm just scrambling for any sort of material that I can get into the garden um, to protect those lovely plants. Yeah. You know, the containers, that's a difficult thing because they can just freeze in a way, right? So containers, and I know you have a whole section in the book about you can do layers in containers and which Guys, you guys, you guys have to all get the book. I'm serious. It's so cool because you made me hungry, by the way, going through it. I'm like, this just feels like really healthy, happy living. Um, but the containers is a big deal because a lot of people I know, even if they have a greenhouse and, you know, they will do containers. So sometimes if you can bring them inside, is that the best thing to do? Um, for many plants that are sensitive to especially cold snaps, like when the temperature drops like a good few degrees outside of the normal range, um, I recommend protecting it if you have a greenhouse or even a shed or um, under the eaves away from any uh, downspouts because you don't want that extra moisture going into the soil. Um, if you can protect it, it's usually better. And if you don't have a covered area away from the elements, then get some burlap. Um, I always recommend going to like a local coffee roaster. Sometimes they have those burlap, like those jute Ooh. bags that they like to either give away or send out to recycling. Many of these roasters are happy to give those bags to you. You take those, cut them up, 
um, yeah, you can cut them down into like long strips or however, like it fits your container, just add those layers on. And as long as there's some sort of buffer, um, away from mm. that cold wind, and it's usually the wind, um, yeah. because the roots are exposed in the container, um, just make sure it's wrapped and that's probably going to be okay. That's a good advice. Thank you on this. I think the wind is mean that, you know, you can mm-hmm. have a cold day, but when the wind is in, in part of it, it's, it's cruel. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> cruel wind is cruel wind. You know, yeah. I, I always wonder about vineyards, you know, this time of year. It's like, okay, the, you know, the, the vines pretty much, they, they hibernate like bears, you know, and, um, but that, that's part of the layers. And I want to get into that. Uh, you've got these eight different layers that you mm-hmm. talk about. And, and to me, the way you garden is how I was raised more in a warmer climate, especially living in Kenya. We had the equator, which was, you know, pretty good growing conditions for a lot of things. <laughs> uh, we did get monsoon rains, though. So that was, you know, interesting. Um, but you talk about eight layers and just being a nature person, to me, the way you're growing and how I introduced you on the show was talking about you are working with nature. And I believe that when we work with nature, you don't need as many pesticides and things like that. You are letting the ecosystem be what it's supposed to be. So with the way you grow with these layered and working up, it is, it reminds me of how a forest works where your berries will be part way up and, you know, there's just these different layers and that's even how animals feed according to layers, different species and different layers per species, you know? Mm-hmm. So yeah, is this a nature thing for you? Like doing the layers? I think yes, yes. In short, yes. And I remember when I was in horticulture school, my instructor, um, always encouraged us to take inspiration from nature. So if you are designing a garden, let's say it's an, just an ornamental garden or food garden or a mix of, you know, both types of plants, which is what I like to do. You mm. kind of look at how plants are spaced and how they are naturally like grouped together in nature. It looks natural to our you know, the, the lizard brain that we have, like it kind of speaks to that and you go, that feels very natural. It feels very comfortable. And then if you get to travel, I'm sure Lisa, when you travel the world, you see these different Mm -hmm. clusters of plants and Mm -hmm. you're like, wow, that's very interesting how you see like a big lush layer of one type of plant. And then like, let's say a big tree in the middle. And then like, what is the interaction? Like how are these lower plants benefiting from maybe the shade of that tree when it's hot, when it's cold, like how does that work? So with the book, I kind of try to break it down for the home gardener. Mm -hmm. How can we look at our surroundings and a appreciate what we already have because we don't want to be chopping down existing trees. Like this is not what I'm encouraging. Right. Um, It's more about like for me, when I go outside, I see beautiful native Douglas firs and cedars. And these, these are our long lived native trees and they serve the wildlife here and they have a purpose. There's a history. And I appreciate that. I'm grateful to be able to have these around my garden, but because they are so tall, they cast shade into parts of the garden. And what can I do about that? I mean, I could add supplemental light, but that's a lot of work. I know that the sun's going to be coming in a certain way. So for me, it's like, okay, let's talk about how to observe how the sun comes in, how it lands on our garden beds, Mm -hmm. and then plant the appropriate plants where the sun lands, or maybe it, or where, maybe where it's heavily shaded. Let's see what we can put there. Um, and not really fight it. And I think a lot of the times when people um, kind of have that understanding, it's more enjoyable and you are kind of encouraged by nature to explore more plants, more mm. than what is ne- usually offered from your local nursery, who is maybe bringing in sort of like the tried and true of all of North America, as opposed to what may do best where you live. Well, you also bring up, and I want to get to the eight layers so people understand this. And and I think what's also brilliant is 
many people are not, they don't have huge yards anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you may buy a house and here's your square, you know, and so you want to utilize it, or maybe you're in a community garden and here's, you know, your raised bed. You, if you have one raised bed, you better use what you can and going, growing up is, you know, I'm always trying to grow up, but it's not working <laughs> for me. But growing up is is a you, a you you're using space in a way um, that makes sense economically, you know, even when you look at it. But you're also working with native edibles, which we don't hear about as much. And I, I really appreciate that part because um, there's just like certain berries and things that you go, oh, I didn't know. Even you, you have a beautiful photo of persimmons, even in the snow, like, oh, we could do that, you know. So um, I think you're you're letting people know that, you know, you've got to think of the indigenous people in, in you know, even where you are with British Columbia, uh, they knew what they could eat. And I don't know who, you know, in, in all the tribes around the world who figured out what you can and can't eat. I don't want to be the first taster to figure out if you're going to survive, <laughs> but, but um, I mean, people survived without nurseries for years and I'm not anti nursery. I'm just saying um, we lived off of native plants to begin with, didn't we? You know? Right. Yeah. So you're, you're taking us to the roots. So, um, I want to get to that, but let's go to the eight layers so people understand the different layers and the fact that by the choices of plants, these plants can come back versus, you know, you've got the annuals, but there's a beauty to what you're doing and it's definitely economical. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd say so. So with my focus, what I've learned over the years, and partly it's because I don't want to say I'm lazy, but once I find a plant that I appreciate, I enjoy, and it maybe it looks good, it's there to stay. And once it's established, you know, it's going to do its thing. And that's when I can incorporate annuals. So that could be the tomatoes, the lettuces, the fast growing seasonal things that we put in. But if we're talking about the different layers, um, the book has um, a focus on perennials. So things that will be longer lived and how we talk about the layers, like just like how we talked about the trees or how I talked about the trees around my garden, the canopy trees are usually the things that are already there. They kind of set the tone. They dictate where the sun or the shade is. And then the next layer down sub canopy mm-hmm. trees. So this could be like the pawpaws that could be the mm-hmm. native persimmons. And then as we go down, we've got shrubs and this is a really fun layer I find because this is where you can incorporate a lot of your native fruiting shrubs. Um, for me, mm-hmm. that would be, I don't know, like salal, huckleberry, thimbleberry, Ooh. chokeberry is a really great North American mm-hmm. native. That is such a beautiful four season plant that I think more people should um, try to keep an eye out for. Um, And then like shrubs are just really cool. And then you can also explore, um, I suppose, like more exotic ones. If you have a greenhouse, it's really fun to explore different fruits that way. Um, Mm. And then um, as we go down the layers, herbaceous perennials and uh, the ground covers. And then I sort of touch on root crops and the rhizosphere. I don't talk about mushrooms or anything. That's a bit out of <laughs> my wheelhouse, but it kind of um, works together hand in hand with the annuals as well, because a lot of those would be the the carrots and the fast growing mm. radishes. So that's kind of in a nutshell, um, how I've kind of laid out the different layers. Oh, I, I love it because it's, it, it makes you, it, it creates an interest. It makes you look at, you know, when you walk through a garden, if everything's on the, on the lower end, right? You're not seeing everything, you know, mm. where you are, but you, it, when you, your eyes can go up as well. Right. Now, right. I know you do, you garden with your son. Um, for the two of you doing this kind of garden where you are looking at, like you said in the beginning about looking, where's the light? Where's, what are the microclimates of your garden? You're learning nature and science and becoming very aware of your surroundings. And um, for the two of you together, are you seeing that help him too to understand the natural world and 
um, kind of stop and smell the roses, so so to speak, versus the phone all the time, you know, for kids, especially now. I think we're all bad of, with phones, but um, you, you know what I mean? Just being able yeah. to get that appreciation for life. Mm-hmm, for sure, for sure. And ever like when he was quite small, I got him out there and he loved it. And uh, we started with just looking at insects. I know a lot of folks, whether you're young or old, you know, insects may not be everyone's cup of tea, but they're mine. These, <laughs> <laughs> I think they're wonderful. Um, like looking at bumblebees, talking about um, why our native bumblebees are worth, um, you know, keeping around and protecting. What can we grow that will feed them? How can we keep leaf litter in the garden so that, you know, the queens have a space to tuck themselves into when it gets Mm. colder so that the next generation can happen. Um, So like insects were a really big thing um, because it was too young to understand like actual plants. Right. And bugs. Yeah. Bugs. Yeah. So I was really happy that he wasn't uh, spooked by insects and then, um, like, first thing that came to mind when you were just mentioning, like, gardening with children, and for my son and I, we have a strawberry patch, like a ground cover strawberry patch. Mm. It's a bit more low growing. The leaves are smaller. The fruit is smaller. Mm-hmm. But what I really enjoyed about that patch was that every year the patch would get larger. Wow. Yeah, it would get larger and spread. So it's actually one of my favorite ground cover plants that just comes back every year and it produces these itty bitty small I think we have the alpine strawberries growing so the fruit is like smaller than the tip of like the pinky and the flavor is so intense it's unlike the store-bought strawberries and they just do their thing and they look so sweet when the flowers are in bloom we see the insects interacting with the flowers and then the fun part is just lifting a leaf and picking off um, berries. And Mm. it's just the act of grazing. And I think that's so special for not just children, but for myself, like, oh, how wonderful. My garden is providing me a treat, a snack. And he's, I don't know that we love that. That's (laughs) that's fun. Well, it's because there's a, there's, and and you're also doing something a healthy snack, right? Mm-hmm. And so and if the you know when you start to see how nature works like that, like oh the bees are here, oh now I get to snack on this. And you said grazing, which is such a good word for it because that's what nature does. Like an animal will come and graze on that. And deer love berries, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, growing up in 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 South Africa and Kenya, we there were the different levels. So like a thorn tree. Uh, you would have an impala pretty much come, uh, antelope, impala antelope eat the grass. And then like the different levels of ant- antelope species would go for eating, grazing the thorn tree, believe it or not, with thorns, um, according to their height. So the Jeronook was like the antelope that had the longest neck and could go up to the top versus um, like, well, kudu is pretty big too, but versus like if you're a dick dick or a, um, Impala. So it, these different levels all happen and they just eat a certain portion. And if they go further, it becomes better for them, right? Better. Mm-hmm. Like you don't want to eat this because that's where the plant says, okay, thank you. You've just done what I needed for my, my, you know, plant cells to know to go and reproduce some more, but that's enough, you know? And so it's very interesting. These systems of nature. That's why I find your book so fascinating and is that I get geek out on that weird stuff, but um, <laughs> you've made it very easy for folks to just go and do and, and use as experiments. And also to think about, hey, you've maybe you've purchased this beautiful pot, right? Um, just a ceramic pot kind of pot, right? <laughs> I've got to be mm-hmm. careful. We're on a growing show. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, I've got this beautiful, I've invested in this beautiful artistic pot, right? Uh, uh, de- decor wise. And what, why would you just put pansies in there if you can actually do flowers that are also like nasturtiums? Like, I think nasturtiums are so underrated. I think they're, we used to eat, get the nectar. We used to eat them in salads. And then there's like little capery things that you can get yes. off of them. As yes. kids, like they were like, 
Oh, and then you hear people talk about the Mediterranean. I'm like, I got it in my backyard. <laughs> I got the, the whole Mediterranean in my backyard. But but the nasturtiums would just grow. And they're so, um, they, they're like morning glories in a way that they love that morning mist, you know. And then the sun comes out and they're like, yay, I'm here. But there's a, I, it's just amazing to me how they can spread this beautiful vine yet they're wonderful for nectar for hummingbirds and different birds, but then also for us to eat. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And um, that reminds me of one of my favorite climbers um, to really get that height. So we were talking about, you know, especially actually, especially if you're growing in a large container and you want some height, whether you are wanting to block out um, your like a view of your neighbor's garbage can or if you yeah. want a privacy screen. Um, one of my favorite plants to grow and it grows so fast is the scarlet runner bean. So it's like a, it's like a pole bean, but it's a different species and it produces big, large edible pods, but, um, it has these beautiful, I guess, like crimson kind of Mm -hmm. like orangey coral flowers that the hummingbirds love. So I grow that mostly for the flowers and the foliage, Uh, not so much the beans. You really got to cook them down, um, especially when they get tough. But, you know, you know, if you want like a container that's tall and beautiful and lush, and if you set up three next to each other, grow a wall of beans, and then you can have trailing nasturtiums. And it's like from top to bottom, these beautiful trailing leaves and then flowers for hummingbirds. And then in between, maybe you have like a perennial, um, like a, like a shrub, like a fruiting shrub, whether it's blueberries or something that likes the conditions that both the nasturtiums and the beans like. I mean, it's really fun to create something that's beautiful, just full of color and food. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, we, you know, as many people know, Nancy and I pets it as we travel. It's not a, it's, it's not a profession for us. It's, it's a kind of house swapping thing, right? And it's really cool because we end up gardening in different climates and zones across the country. I love it. And I mean, the principles are the same, but you have to learn. It's like you get there the first night and you're like, you better learn what time the sun rises. You better, <laughs> you're in a different time zone. Um, all of that, but one of our, our favorite sets, uh, is out in Arkansas, up in the mountains, Fayetteville. And the lady we, we've sat for, and she has a donkey, so it's really cool. She has her own manure. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> anyway, that's I amazing. Donkey. No, it's cool because she let, but so she purchased this farm property. And so in the middle is this old farmhouse that she redid herself. Like, so props to her for that. Um, it's just, I love to see women go out there and get, get in it, you know, and mm-hmm, that we can, we, you know, we can do it. And she left both sides, each, each side, like there's a huge meadow, let it go to native plants. And there's in the middle of it all day lilies, because there's a lot of seed spreaders going on in Arkansas. It is a natural state and it's hot and swampy and warm and it is hot in summer. And that's when we always are there in the summer, but, um, the I mean it's just beautiful to see and at night the fireflies just giant oak trees mm. you're not even allowed to park your car near the oak tree because she wants to protect the roots of the oak it's this ancient oak tree like it's got a few of them and then she grows all these interesting vegetable like, and one of them was the scarlet beans and that's my first time they're long man these things are long <laughs> yeah I was like going what are these and she's like okay Every day I had to go out and try not to let it like actually start to attach to her house because they will attach. They're vigorous. They're, they're like wisteria in that way, but it was so cool. And they, um, had all kinds of caterpillars that would come and hang out and, um, frogs, tree frogs that were hanging out on them. That was the biggest thing. She had this ecosystem of what was happening. And if you just let it be, except for the squash bugs, we, I don't want to talk about those. They, mm -mm. Um, they, but the, a lightning bolt took out the squash plant that had the squash bugs. Seriously. Oh. Oh. Took it out. They have blanket, uh, lightning. Like just, I, I can't even explain the amount of lightning they get there, oh, wow. but they, it's insane. It's like a curtain of lightning bolts that would happen in these storms. But there are plants, except for that one, you know, survived, but she also grew, uh, she has her vegetables growing amongst the flowers. 
Mm-hmm. And like, so she's like, oh, my pollinators are right here. I don't need, she has zinnias growing. And then she uses, she's, you know, um, kind of created a plot. Like she did some straw bales in some parts. She's got a big property, but she created one that because she has deer and bunny, I mean, it's wild in Arkansas. <laughs> so you kind of want to corner off from the predators, right? Um, so she started doing all these crazy cool vines, these squash flowers. And I wish I could remember what it was, but it was, I mean, a loofah squash or something, like a loofah or something. Those oh my fun. gosh. <laughs> it was like, we'd go out to go look every day to see what was blooming in what was going on, but her garden thrived, man. She also used like tomatoes. I've seen people do that where tomatoes are kind of one of those, depending on where you are, but that can be part of that layer, right? Tomato plants, Mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. they kind of are like mini trees in a way. They're delicate though, but not. Tomatoes are weird. Like (laughs) the more I think of them, they're weird. (laughs) They they are weird. I think technically you know, from where they were originally from, you leave them as perennials. They kind of just grow and grow and grow if you let them. But Mm -hmm. I mean, for where I live, I really have to baby them once the temperatures start to dip. Oh, But yeah, yeah, I can imagine how like a tomato plant can just get a bit gnarly and a bit out of control. What about, because a lot of the plants that you're talking about are are perennials, which are Mm -hmm. cool and they'll come back. When a lot of times we'll think of, oh, we're going to grow a vegetable garden. We end up, we'll try to do the seedling route or go buy the little seedlings. And every year it's like starting over. It seems like with what you're doing, you're, they are investments. They'll come back on their own. Like a, a banana plant will keep providing, right? Unless they freeze because we've heard that too. Um, yeah. <laughs> been, yeah, they yeah. actually, banana trees will freeze and crack and explode with ice. It's insane depending well, on where you live. There's a lot of water in them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, like with these perennials, that's one of the things I love is that, yes, they're investment, whether it's time up front, if you start from seed or if you um, purchase them, um, like money was, <laughs> they're a bit of an investment depending on what you're getting, but they come back, they grow bigger. And I think that's really fun. If you made a choice that you really enjoy it's really great to have that be a part of your home or your garden piece that you can enjoy throughout the years. Mm, I like that. It's sustainable. Mm, Yeah, I think so. It just, it's, I don't know, but I think when we can, because then you're investing in the health of the soil too, right? So is there something about that, about a plant being able to come back that the actual health of your garden rises up with that kind of thing. You know, if sometimes plants do just say, I'm done now, Mm -hmm. adios. But um, is there something about that, the way you're gardening and doing these layers, um, that the, with the ecosystems that they'll last longer and that the actual, do you, do they get stronger that you don't need chemicals and things like that to, you know, with pests and things? Yeah, that's a great question. And I like to step a bit back. And um, it's more like if you can, I think the exercise of choosing, uh, and let's just use the term investment plant. um, When you take the time to research and then buy the plant that is suitable for your garden, whether it's the uh, com- well, it should be a combination of your soil conditions, you know, and your temperature and understanding your climate. Um, when you go through that process and you find it the right spot to grow so that it can thrive, then that can be its forever home. And that way you you are not doing the annual let's dig up the soil and cause disturbance because there's a lot of beneficial organisms living in the soil Every time Mm. you unearth a whole bunch of soil unnecessarily, um, then you disturb that. Um, It's not always a bad thing because, I mean, heck, for annual crops, you do need to do that activity. So maybe it's striking a balance between, okay, I've got these beds that are going to do its thing. I'm not going to touch them um, for the next one, two, three years if the plants are happy. 
Um, of course, if the plants need to be divided, so let's say I have an artichoke or cardoon patch or maybe a mint patch that is getting a bit crowded, then yes, it's good to give the plant space. And the healthy thing to do is to unearth the plant, um, mm-hmm. divide them. You can, you can give them to friends or you can sell them at a plant sale and then put that plant back where its happy home is and then just let that reestablish itself if it's happy and if you still love the plant and if it's still providing some sort of purpose to your garden. Um, and I think having a balance between that mm-hmm. and having, let's say, your annual beds where you have to remove plants at the end of the season and then you know, add amenders if needed, you know, with that disturbance, I think that is a very um, realistic way to approach it. So for me, it's not all or nothing. Not everything Mm. in my garden is perennial, but it Mm. is trying to push more of the activities to, um, you know, letting plants do their thing. And -hmm. then I will assist them when they need the space or if there's know other issues that I would need to help them out with Um, like if they're not happy with their home if they need more sun then I will step in and figure out what needs to be done as opposed Mm -hmm. to just digging up the same plot every single year I love it I mean and then that makes it easier for you too Mm -hmm. yeah yeah Um, especially if there's ground cover so I mentioned the strawberry um, mm-hmm. There's also wild ginger that grows nicely up oh. here. Self heal is one of my favorite plants. It's commonly referred to as like a turf grass weed, turf grass weed, but it's it mm. blooms purple. It's so beautiful. It's great for um, our native bees, and it's a highly medicinal plant as well. It hugs the ground. I let them sit as patches on the ground to protect the soil, to stop erosion. It does so much, and there are so many plants like that. So if mm. you leave a ground cover patch intact, it does so much for the soil. And if they are able to stay evergreen, or if you choose evergreen ones, then um, if you get colder winter uh, uh, temperatures or conditions, if they can add that greenery to your ground, mm-hmm. it just is just so beautiful when everything else has just kind of died down. It's neat. I mean, you've got even like prickly pear in your book. I I love going through your book. Uh, <laughs> people <laughs> need to check it out. No, because you put the prickly pear and we lived out in the desert and we went in the high desert when we were out in Joshua Tree area. And the snow would come and freeze and then it would pretty much go away. But I mean, it was either like a hundred degrees plus or, you know, sorry, we're in California. I'm not California, Oregon. So I I don't know Mm. what, um, we're all in different times or temperature zones or (laughs) whatever it is, Celsius, Fahrenheit. I don't know because every place I'm different. And then sometimes I'm like, what country am I in? (laughs) So I don't know anymore. But anyway, it, it's either really hot or you're freezing, right? It's, there, there's no, there's a, maybe a month or two of in between and then that month is when nature says i'm going to blow you away and you know so seeds you know um the prickly pear to me is really interesting i remember reading a book um it was a gentleman who was actually writing about new mexico and saving this one piece of land um from oil people and all this natural stuff and he started talking about the importance of grasses and grasses in um like in your garden, leave the grass to grow around the cactus because it's like a mulch. It's Mm -hmm. like this protector and it's natural. And we started doing it and things changed in our garden. Like it just, the system, I don't know. I just, the we had wildflowers eventually just come naturally once we amended the soil because it was a newer house and the soil was toxic. I mean, everything, the first thing we did was, you know, plant wildflowers and they came out these little tiny, tiny, I mean, bluebells were like, Mm. not even like your finger, like teeny. And so we realized our soil was bad, but once we did it and we did like a balance of native and then what we wanted to eat and let plants kind of shade themselves, you know, Mm -hmm. and the cactus did that. It was also a place where quail could hide with their babies, you know, from snakes and, and all of that. Um, but the fruit is edible and then you have flowers and the, mm-hmm. that's edible too, depending, um, on who, what and where, you know, 
I don't want people to eat bad things. I don't no. want the person who says eat this and, you know, <laughs> but the prickly pear gets looked at like cactus gets looked over, but it culturally is a food for people and it's beautiful. Absolutely. You know? so, yeah. Yeah. I was so happy to see that in your book. So I didn't even, so you can grow it in your area. Well, for us, well, I mean, Pacific Northwest, we always have to be um, very mindful of wet conditions. So mm-hmm. as long as there's maybe like a rock wall or like a gravelly area um, where you don't have to worry about like anything underground rotting, I think that is um, usually where we see these types of plants not do mm-hmm. well. Again, that moisture and cold combination. But, you know, if you can find, um, you know, well draining kind of soil or gravelly, then that's going to be a lot better. Well, your wild ginger is interesting to me because there's ginger that I know that grows all the way up with spikes and then like spiked flowers and everything. Mm. But your wild ginger in here reminds me of uh, miner's lettuce. When we lived up in the mountains, we had miner's lettuce that would grow kind of in a meadowy area, very low ground cover. And it was edible, which we didn't know until we lived there. And people were like, you know, mountain people, <laughs> they're mm-hmm. like, you can eat your backyard. I'm like, really? Okay, let's try it. And honestly, it was like little lettuce and they had little white flowers in the center. I wonder if they're related. They look so alike. They do. Um, uh, yeah, they do look alike. And I love miner's lettuce. It's one of those crops that I always recommend people seeding. Like if you have a bed that you just don't want to touch and it gets you know, shade and you just want to throw something that's really interesting. Miner's lettuce is wonderful. Um, Wild ginger is um, kind of serves the same purpose, but it's a longer lived plant. It's slower to establish, but I've seen them ornamentally under maple trees or, you know, like small specimen trees in gardens that aren't necessarily interested in edible elements. Um, Some folks just don't have that as a focus. But I've seen gardeners put wild ginger under trees and it's so beautiful because the leaves are interesting and kind of round Mm -hmm. with this like upside down heart shape. And it's the rhizomes that have this, uh, you know, really neat edible quality. Uh, The flowers of these guys are not not showy at all. It's really interesting. You really have to get down on your knees, Mm -hmm. flip over a leaf and look for the little like brownish kind of maroon flowers. And I think that's really special. Like it's like a little secret that you have with a plant. It's like, I know what you have. I'm going to take a peek and then leave yeah, you alone. Yes. Oh, yeah, I know, right? That's like a whole other, yeah, the peeper creepers. Yeah. <laughs> that's what they are. That's what it is. Well, the other thing, you have the passion fruit in there and that's something I grew up with, but you call them May Pops. And the passion fruit to me, honestly, is, and we've seen it in this country in, um, Flo- uh, in Tennessee, we, I'm just thinking of like where we saw uh, California, Southern California, a friend had a farm in Fallbrook, which is where they grow avocados. And um, she was growing things you know, like poinsettias. And even, you know, she's like, someone would give her a poinsettia. She's like, all right, I'll plant it outside. And it would be like a, like a bush. Mm. Like by the time yeah. she was it just, it was that weather for it, you know, and that climate, but the, she had passion fruit, but we saw it also in Arkansas. And a Native American garden, heritage, cultural heritage garden for mm-hmm. the Plum Bio people. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to live in here. And they did exactly what you're talking about. They did, um, and it was a national, a state park, Toltec Mounds, uh, just outside Little Rock, Arkansas. And they have uh, this, I don't know what it is about this garden, but I want to keep going back there. It's um, circular, but they did the raised layered garden, like what you're talking about. Um, they had their squash and they had beans, you know, like the three sisters, I think they call it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But then the passion fruit kind of just was like almost like woven around the plants. It just did its thing around it and was almost like the keeper of the the beans and everything. It's kind of interesting mm. how that worked. Sounds they, it's like they work together. Yeah. Like they're like, hey, I'm going to weave into you. <laughs> You know, but the flowers, but Maypop, so Maypop is for a colder climate. For a colder climate, yeah. It's still not as common even where I live. Um, A lot Mm. of growers prefer to put them in the greenhouse um, just for added protection, even though they are quite tolerant of 
uh, colder temperatures. Um, maybe it just adds, you know, a tropical vibe in a greenhouse setting. Um, but yeah, they're known to uh, be quite cold hardy down to, I think like minus, I'm just, I'm trying to do that conversion in my head too. I think once we get down yeah. to the minus, minus twenties, I think Everyone minus twenties. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Minus twenties Fahrenheit Celsius in that kind of area. So they are tolerant of colder conditions, but, um, usually when I do hear people growing them here, it's in a greenhouse. Um, oh, whether, okay. yeah, yeah. I haven't seen them just out in the wild. Um, in oh the neighborhood, but it would be very lovely with the beautiful and, purple flowers. And and the daylilies I was talking about earlier, I know that's not native everywhere, but in some areas, it's almost just become that or invasive. I don't. You talk about that too, um, yeah. but I did want to mention that they are edible. The flowers, right? We can eat those. They are. They're absolutely edible. You just have to make sure that um, you identify day lilies correctly because there are oh. other lilies yeah because there could be other lilies that are kind of that orangey or reddish yellow that are grown like that are very common in ornamental gardens and many of them are not good for us or pets to consume or be close to especially dogs and cats many of the lilies are a no-no yeah um, yeah yeah that's yeah yeah, yeah. She, she yeah the lady in arkansas had them on the other yeah. side like in poinsettias by the way people are not good for dogs either mm. um or cats um you you um are hanging out with ferns ostrich fern uh that's one i don't know i could go through your whole book with you all day long <laughs> i know we can't but i would i would i would love it because i'm all into these plants um but the ferns now i know people eat ferns and i've always looked at the whole frond and you've got a great photo in there of the ostrich fern um with the fronds all curled up and i love personally i love photographing them that's a thing but every time i look at them i just want to eat them like i'm sorry you're so pretty this is like this magical piece of, you know it's like when you look at um ah uh, we always get them all muddled up it's the like queen's and lace the mm. wild carrot right yes, i don't yes. we oh that that's that could be messy but there's something magical about the way it i don't i could look at that for days just how it all unfurls right and it's the yeah. same thing with the fern but for some reason i want to eat them even though mm. i'm admiring them i really i've never eaten a fern can we eat them is is that a bad thing why do i want to eat them <laughs> fiddle necks <laughs> like I, I do i just feel like they yeah. should be in a nice creamy sauce or something yeah I yeah i have seen them in specialty grocery stores i'm like oh yeah, wow. this urge to eat them. Um, kind of like asparagus in a way. They look yes. like they would taste like asparagus. Yes, kind of like fleshy. And you know it's going to be a bit of like juicy in there with some fiber. Um, if you catch them before um, the fronds get all like tough, yeah. then they no, all, truly that. are a seasonal delicacy. Um, ostrich fern is the, I'd say like the standard type of fern that you would want to go for. Um, mm -hmm. There are other ferns depending on where you live that are edible if they're you know mm -hmm. yes you can eat them but are they tasty some are not as tasty um bracken fern which is just it's um it covers like a lot of areas up here mm -hmm. um, people can eat them and they are usually pulled out because they um are quite aggressive and can really um them and the um the invasive blackberries. Oh, they can tag team and just take over the space. But I mean, the bracken fern, you can eat them. Would I eat them? Not really. I would wait for the ostrich ferns. And uh, the ostrich ferns, if you have the right conditions, they are beautiful for the garden. They do want the shade. They do want moisture. Um, but they're really great under trees or at back of an area along, maybe not along a fence, but like near like a shaded area. It just adds this beautiful green color, super soft, beautiful foliage. They can get quite big. So if you're looking to fill out a space, hey, you can have your own patch of um, fiddleheads. Oh, and yeah. then there's blueberries in your book, which I find <laughs> exciting because we've actually done um, video work with... Um, a nursery that cultivated them um, up in Washington state. And they did like the pink lemonade blueberries. Mm. Um, I don't know. The name was Briggs. Um, I don't know. It's, you know, anyway, 
it was amazing what they were doing with blueberries. But what really got me is hiking up in the Blue Ridge Mountains um, in uh, Appalachia country. And we're on a hike with some friends and literally could just eat blueberries as we were walking by them. I'm going, really? When you find things that are native and you're going, you, you know, we go through extremes to get blueberries and things mm-hmm. like that to, to grow. So part of what excited me about your book with the blueberries in there and things, um, sometimes you can get these, like you you showcase that are native or do really well. And so you're not only feeding yourself, but you've created a wildlife habitat. I know a lot of people want certified wildlife habitats with the National Wildlife Federation out here. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a really cool thing if you are giving back in a way, because like if a bird's eating your berries, aren't they going to eat the bugs? So you don't have to do the pesticides. So, and then we get to still watch the bug before they go bye bye, (laughs) which is fun. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Like the full course of life here. Um, So I, I really appreciate that part of, you know, that you can have things like blueberries and even grapes, but maybe they're just not the same ones you're going to get in the store. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, with grapes, um, especially like, yes, you can get to experience different varieties and you can enjoy having your own mini vineyard or if you, yeah, Mm -hmm. if you make your own wines. Um, But with what you were saying with having this whole little ecosystem, inviting the birds, having, you know, them take, um, take the role of, you know, pest management. And that's one of the beautiful things with having a variety. So f- a lot of the times as gardeners, we think about what's in it for me? What can I eat? What can I grow that beautifies my garden? But once mm-hmm. you step back again and go, okay, so my garden is a part of this bigger system and you look around the the forests, look around the neighborhood, you know, what, how is nature in the form of like the wildlife, whether it's like insects, Mm -hmm. birds, furry creatures that will um, come into your space? Like, how does this all knit together? Uh, How do my interactions in what I would call my space, how does that affect these creatures? Can I provide them with a space for nesting? Can mm. I provide them with um, fruit that I may not necessarily eat, but I know that they're going to enjoy? How can I encourage them to, you know, feel at home here? So mm. right now, um, I grow service berries, and I think mm. uh, I think the birds almost also liked. Um, I have two gomi shrubs, mm. and the birds love those. They're not my favorite fruit to eat myself. But the Mm. birds come and I can hear them hopping along like under the hedges and, you know, they're, they're they're eating insects. They are uh, nesting and they've got their young somewhere in the garden. And it's, that's sort of like next level rewarding. Yeah. Um, And it's not just the fruit. Yeah. Yeah. It's fruit, seeds and nuts. Cause you even go like, you have the whole section on the hedgerow, right? Like here's your spoils of the hedgerow. And I'm like looking at this going, that reminded me when we lived in England. I was like, I remember going getting crab apples and blackberry, like mm. again, layered up, right? That's how nature works. Yeah. You'd have the blackberries kind of at arm's length and then up you'd have the crab apples, you know, and we had chestnuts too. Like we'd play what was called knockers. And no, I don't mean that same thing as you think in England. <laughs> don't, <laughs> but um, we would play with these chestnuts and it is kids and, but you could roast them and you, you know, it was amazing when I saw that in your book, I was like, she's going for the nuts too, like the Fulberts. And, yeah. you know, that's something no one touches on. You, we rarely hear about nuts and seeds like sunflower seeds. I know birds love that, but we can also take a little bit and give a little bit, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. I I love your book. Can you tell? <laughs> I, I'm glad I everyone you do. Is, thank you. Oh no, it's been so much fun uh having you on the show. Uh, thank you so much, Christina. Everybody's Christina Chung. Again, you can follow her on Instagram at fluent.garden. Her website is also uh fluent.garden. Um, but her book is going to be out uh February 6th, so go pre-order it. Be the first on the block. Be the garden gossiper. Like you need to be the, you know 
the symbol of gossip because you're going to have the book first, right? Um, do you peek over your garden, like your garden wall, fence, flowers, and look at what your neighbors are doing ever, Christina? Oh, actually, I have new neighbors um, right across <laughs> like the back fence, and they are growing some amazing subtropical um, fruit. I think I spotted mango, um, no, maybe papaya. I'm not too sure. I haven't introduced myself to my neighbors. Um, I haven't actually seen them around yet, but I do see their plants. So I need oh. to snoop around and see what they're up to. Because, I love that. I yeah. will, you know, good neighbors are good for like nip and tuck, as we call it. Like you walk your dog and then snip a little in your pocket. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? So, yeah. but I mean, they, they better get the blankets out tonight, you know, with what's going on with the snow and, and this cold snap going through. So if they've got the tropicals, mm, but you know, tropical plants are used to snaps as well, you know, yeah. Um, but it just depends. So everyone, again, the book is called The Layered Edible Garden, A Beginner's Guide to Creating a Productive Food Garden Layer by Layer. Check it out. And it's going to be out through Cool Springs Press. Thank you so much, Christina. Thank you so much, Lisa, for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you for joining us here on Big Blend Radio's Garden Gossip Show. Thanks for growing with us. You can follow us at BigBlendRadio.com. 